All right. And I know some people will be streaming in, you know, as we start talking about things. So we'll we'll start off with something that is not as important. Okay. Um, so in my previous class, you know, I don't know how many how many of you have done your personality test. Um, okay. So. <clears throat> So this is a website you know, where you can go. Don't do it in the class, okay? Do it after the class. But this is a website you can go to in order to do what we call a personality test. And this is based on MBTI, which is the Maya Briggs type indicator. Um, some people dispunk this and go like, this is totally useless, you know, it's not accurate. And other people you know, say, it's really accurate, it's kind of creepy, you know, how you can answer like 50 questions and they seem to know everything about you, including stuff that you do not know about yourself prior to the test, taking the test. So, so you can take the test, um, and what is kind of interesting is, um, okay, there's a pragmatic reason to, to take the test, because depending on your personality, it, it kind of helps to, um, it can highlight your strengths and you know what you may not be very good at. Okay, for instance, myself, okay, um, I would not make a very good nurse, okay, or a priest, <laughs> okay. So I know certain things I would not be very good at, okay. Um, I would not not make a very good artist, okay, because I don't really judge, okay, you know anything. I cannot evaluate, you know, what is better. Give me two things, I go like, do they work? Yep. Okay. Cool. But which one looks better? I don't care. Which one looks better? I don't know. Don't ask me those questions. Okay, so you know it might be helpful you know to take the uh, personality test just to see you know um, which one matches you the best, uh, match you the best. But just to encourage you guys to take that test, um, this is a you know a website where they use popular um, media and uh, they compare you know characters from. Uh, the Game of Thrones, My Little Pony, Lord of the Rings, of course, uh, The Walking Dead, and Harry Potter, Disney Princesses, Grey's Anatomy, Anatomy, Marvel, you know, heroes and villains. So you know, once you identify your type, your type. You know, this page you know kind of gives you some really kind of entertainment value out of it, um, because now you can say, oh, okay, I'm an INTP. I, I can make fun of myself. So I'm an INTP, and let's see who's an INTP. Mr. Fantastic. Who is that? Huh? Oh, that's Amber. It doesn't. I cannot read that small. Oops. Central yeah. flaws. I'm I'm zooming in. Oh, it, it is it is the end. Hank, um, what is his last name? Yep. And also Emma Frost. So those are the INTPs. And some of these are not really exactly accurate. You know, it says Yoda is an INTP. I'm not really sure that Yoda is an INTP. The uh, Emperor is an INTJ. I don't know about that. <clears throat> of course, there's the huh? What's Darth Vader? Darth Vader is a ESTJ. Somehow, I don't think he's an E. He's not an extrovert. Yep. So this may not be accurate. Um, entertaining for sure, though. So in the Star Trek universe, um, the Doctor from uh, Voyager is supposed to be an INTP. I don't think that is the case because he seems pretty judging, but he could be. I think he could be because you know, when whenever he is activated, how many of you have seen that you know, series, Star Trek Voyager? You guys are too young. Okay, fine. <laughs> but I but the the, the hollow deck doctor. You know, the first thing he would say is he be in a very you know impatient way. He will say you know, state your reason of emergency. No. Something like that. Okay, he's not a very good doctor. Okay, um, from that sense. 
So just you know, fun stuff that you can kind of do with uh, this. But when you when you go to this part here, okay, I'm just going to click on you know specific types here. I'm, I can make fun of myself. So we go to the analytical people analysts, and INTP is called a logician. But it will also give you some interesting profiles. It will tell you um, about strengths and weaknesses and career paths. Okay, so from as far as I'm concerned, you know, I think this part may benefit you the most. Is you can look up your personality type, look at career path, and then ex do your exploration there. Um, you know, like for myself, okay, if I try to become an artist, that would not be very good. Okay, there are there are INTPs that can you know do art. Um, uh, Matt Stoller from uh, Art New Media is an INTP, and he's perfectly okay, you know, doing art. But he's doing multimedia kind of art. So there's technology involved. It is not the artsy art kind of art. You know, it's animation, 3D modeling, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of technology, a lot of you know actual logic involved in the so-called art that he does. Okay, so this is just something that you might want to do. You know, when you have free time to do it. Hmm. Sorry. <laughs> It doesn't. It doesn't mean that you. Know, if you're INTP, you cannot do art, but that may not be something that you want to do for a living. It's, your, it's the strongest. Uh, what do you call it? It's your function for each of the letters, right? Yep. It's so your your strongest function as an INTP is a TI in this case. So logic is you know, something that INTPs are very good at, but not feeling and not you know remembering things. Okay. <clears throat> And if you look it up, they also have famous people, you know, for each type. So you can actually see, oh, I'm of this type, and who? What are the famous people of that type? Now, INTP is interesting because most um, entertainment people in the entertainment industry would not be an INTP. You would probably think, you know, why would someone who's logical, uh, introvert, you know, be a good fit as an entertainer? Well, there are very few people, you know, who make it, you know, as you know, comedians mostly. Because INTP people are also known to be very sarcastic, and that works sometimes as a comedian. So as it turns out, Tina Fey um, is an INTP. She's also like she writes for all these different shows, so she has a lot of. There's a lot of it needs a lot of the you know, logic and uh, pattern and stuff like that. So just kind of interesting stuff. All right, so getting back to this class, okay, I think I, I, I leave enough time for people to stream in already. So getting back to this class, we last time we started to talk about the processor, remember? Okay, it's one big mess, right? So what we'll do today is we'll start to get into the processor, and we'll start to examine what do we do, how do we get something done with that processor. So the first thing we do, and for this part of the class, you know, from here on, um, I think the video recording is going to be a lot more helpful than if I just type the notes. Because you know, if I just type the notes in text and show you the pictures, it is actually harder to follow compared to the interactive display of you know what goes on with these things <coughs> with um, the processor. So let me see if I have the processor folder. Yep, I do. Okay, so we go to the processor folder. Um, no, you don't have to. So Java dash jar. Downloads, logic sim, generic, and then we can directly to processor, WDPC2. There we go. So we got the, the processor here. And what we'll do today is to think about um, how do we get things done? In other words, let's identify the most important components first. So I'm going to move this over here a little bit. I don't really need this part anymore because the design is already done. <clears throat> and we can zoom in just one level. There we go. This is RAM. Okay. In other words, you know, this is the part of the computer where things can change because it is it's random access memory. And then we have the ALU <coughs> over here. This is the component where all the computations occur. If you want to add, it's, it happens here. If you want to subtract, it happens here, and so on. 
And when you look at the area that it takes in this particular schematic, it is disproportional. In other words, in a real processor, the ALU will take up the majority of the real estate, okay, silicon, as opposed to the rest of the components. The other component that is of really of a lot of interest to us is the register bank, which is a bank of four individual registers in this case. So these are the major bigger components. The rest that are actually taking up a lot of space when you look at this schematic are mostly the tunnels. <laughs> okay, the tunnels are just the labels, like this one, that's a tunnel, that's a tunnel, that's a tunnel, that's a tunnel, and so on. And then all of the other ones are just individual registers as well as muxes, multiplexers, and demultiplexers or demuxes. Okay. So this picture is definitely not proportional in terms of area. Um, which component takes up how much room in here is not proportional to how the actual design works out on the die, on the processor die. All right. So what we want to do is to say, well, since everything is here in RAM, in order to execute an instruction, we need to read from memory to say, okay, what instruction are we executing? So the first step is to read an instruction from memory. So to read, it, to read something in memory, let's figure out how that is done in this picture. So the first thing we need to know is what is going to specify the location from which I'm reading. That's the first thing you need to figure out. That's why I'm highlighting, highlighting this particular wire, because this wire connects to the A or the address port of the, of the RAM, which specifies which location am I reading from or which location am I writing to. Is that okay? That's the first step. And the second thing we need to know is, hey, it stops right here at a MUX, at a multiplexer. So now we have to say, which way is it coming from? If you click on the first one, it goes into another DMUX, which goes into the register bank, which means there is a way for a specific processor, I mean a register, to specify, hey, this is the address, this is the location that we want to pay attention to. But we also want to explore the other path, which is this path here. And this path connects straight to a register called the PC, the program counter. The program <coughs> counter, as it turns out, is the register to remember where is the instruction of the, where is the next instruction that I need to execute. Is that okay so far? So when all your instructions are stored in RAM, you need a bookmark to say, okay, where do I get the next instruction? The program counter serves exactly that particular purpose. Okay? So at this point, you know, according to the setup of the multiplexer, which one is driving the, data, the address bus? So when you look at this box over here, <clears throat> when you look at this multiplexer, which input is it taking to become the output of this particular multiplexer? It's using the program counter because you can see the control signal that selects which input is light green, bright green. That means it's a one, which means you know instead of using input zero, this is the label zero here. Instead of using input zero, it's using input one to become the output. And input one, which is this wire, connects to the output of the program counter, which is a register, which is always driving the output. So are we doing okay so far with this picture? So we know at this point the program counter is specifying which address in RAM that we want to do operations with. Okay, since we are doing something with RAM, let's figure out what operation are we doing with RAM. Okay, first of all, you know, the select pin here is a light green, which means the RAM component is in fact selected. It is enabled. Is that okay? <coughs> But when RAM is selected and enabled, we can perform one of two operations. We can be reading from RAM, we can also be writing from RAM. So according to this picture, are we reading at this point or are we writing to it? We are reading because LD is a one. And remember, LD is the same thing as R slash W, which means R, which means one asserts that we are reading and zero asserts that we are writing. So we're in fact reading from RAM Okay. So if we are reading from RAM, it is selected. That means the data port of the RAM is driving this wire. 
So the question now is, who's paying attention? This wire, the one that is highlighted right now, that is thick, is already this is of the it has the content of the location that we are dealing with. And of course, you know, since everything is zero, it doesn't make it easy to see. So what I can do here is to change this location to mm, FE, okay? And you can see how this wire is now representing FE also, because F is 1111, and E, which is one less than F, is 1110. So are we still doing okay so far with this picture, okay? So the question now is, who is reading it? Who is up getting updated you know, based on the data bus coming out of the RAM? Well, it connects to quite a few places. It connects to the instruction register. It also connects to this particular D multiplexer. It cannot be this one, because this one connects to the output of the register bank, which doesn't make sense. Because at this point, the data bus is being driven by the RAM, by you know, the read access mem uh, random access memory, which means you know, nothing else should be driving that particular bus at this point. So when you look at this picture, um, okay, let me get rid of this first. There we go. So when you look at this picture, is this particular demultiplexer driving its output? How do you know it's not driving the output? Because the enable is a dark green, you know, which means it is not enabled. Okay, so that's good because if it is driving, we can end up with a bus fight at this point. This thick wire also goes to this particular MUX or multiplexer, <coughs> and that particular multiplexer goes to here. But does it even matter? Which, which input is this multiplexer selecting at this point? Zero. It's selecting zero because this Y is dark green, which means it is selecting input zero to connect to the output. So that means this wire, the one that is thick at this point, is not is irrelevant. Okay, so it's not going there. Let's check out this one here, the instruction register. Do you think the instruction register is paying attention? It is paying attention because the enable is a one. Okay, so when you look at the instruction register and the E N, the enable Y is a one, it means it is ready to update, but it's not updating yet because it needs an edge. The instruction register is one is one is the only one register that updates on a falling edge. So when you when you click on it using the pointing tool or the selection tool, you will see over here. Oh, it is, it's still a rising edge, I, I correct myself. It's the other one that is a falling edge. So this one will update on the rising edge. So in the next clock, if I do a control T right now, which is a rising edge clock, you will see the instruction register updating to FE because that is what is uh, this location in RAM that is read, it's reading from. Is that okay? So what do you think it's going to do next? So let's reverse that question and say, okay, based on these control signals, what is going to happen next? There are a few key pieces that you have to pay attention to. The instruction register is one, and then there's also the microcode pointer here, which is the other one, and then there's also the program counter. So all of these components are important. At this point, the clock is at a high state, which for the most part is not useful because most uh, registers update on a rising edge but not on a falling edge. But remember, I said there's, only, there's one register that updates on the falling edge. It is the microcode pointer. When you click on this one, the trigger is a falling edge. So that means when I clock again, when I type control T on the keyboard again, so that the clock goes from high, currently it is high, when it goes from high to low, this register will update. But the question is, what is it updating to? Well, let's figure out. The input of this particular register, which is this really kind of thick wire, is connecting to this multiplexer. And this particular multiplexer is connected to um, this. So right now, it is connecting to this wire, because the selection <coughs> is selecting this one here. Is that making any sense? Because it's a multiplexer, the selection pin 
is specifying a 1, so that means input 1 becomes the actual output of this multiplexer. But do you recognize this circuit? It's your music box. It's the, music, it's the mechanism of the music box that keeps incrementing a pointer, incrementing a counter. Okay. Okay. So that means you know, upon the falling edge right now, the micro flow pointer will update to a 1. Does that make any sense? Because when you select this wire, which, is, which I've selected right now, it specifies 1. And that is what the microcode pointer would update to. Is that okay? Let's check out the program counter. The program counter also has a rising edge update, you know, trigger, so it's not going to be updated at this point. So we do a control T, and you can see the micro code pointer is now incremented and it's pointing to the next location in ROM. Remember, this part is a ROM, the other one over here, you know. I have to scroll a little bit. This one is RAM. RAM is where you store the instructions that your compiler outputs. The ROM is inside the processor. It cannot really be updated. Is that okay? So there are two memory modules that are needed in order to execute the program. One is external to the processor. RAM is external to the processor. And you have plenty of those. You have 16 gigs and, or whatnot you know, of RAM. But the ROM, on the other hand, is very small. It is inside the processor itself. It cannot be changed when you run your program. So the ROM is always there. Is that OK? All right. So now that the clock is low, what is it going to do next? In other words, what is rising edge sensitive and it is enabled at this point? That is the next question. So you have to look at the bright green wires and figure out which one is enabled at this point. <clears throat> okay, so according to this diagram, what do you think is going to be updated at this point? The program counter, very good. So the program counter has is enabled turning bright green. And how do you think it is going to be updated? So let's go ahead and zoom into the program counter here. And I'm going to zoom in one step more, just so that it is easier to see what's around the program counter. This is the program counter. How is it going to be updated? It is almost like a music box mechanism, except it's got a box, you know, at its, in, at its input, which means it can select one or the other input to be so that it can update based on one of those inputs. Which one do you think is it's going to select? With this box here, this is a dark green wire which means input 0 is going to be the one it selects to update. Input 0 is the output of the adder. The adder is currently adding 1 because the carry in is a, is a 1. So that means the program counter is going to increment by 1 when we have a rising edge of the clock. Okay, very good. So the program counter is quote unquote auto incrementing because it has read the instruction already at location zero, that instruction is now in the, in the instruction register. So now it wants to increment to prepare for the next instruction, to read the next instruction in. Is that okay so far? All right. What else do you think might be updated in this particular clock cycle? The micro code pointer also has its enable turn on. But this one is updating on a falling edge. So the rising edge won't affect it, but the falling edge following it following will update it. Is that okay so far? So those are the two registers you know currently with the enable turned on. So I do a control T. So when you when I do the control T you can see how the program counter is now zero one, which is you know the way we expected it to work. And with the micro code pointer, it is still stuck with one because the micro code pointer updates on the falling edge, not on the rising edge. Now that the clock is high, the next time I type control T, it's going to be a falling edge. So the, the micro code pointer will update when I type control T again. But the question is, what is it going to update to? Zero. Hmm? Well, it's not going to be updating to zero, zero, 002 anymore. Or, 002 because it's in hexadecimal. 
Okay, so each digit inside the pro inside the register is a hexadecimal digit. So you would think it's 0, 0, 002, but that's not the case. Because when you look at these mugs, the selection is zero. So it's selecting input zero to be the output of these mugs. Is that okay? But what connects to this particular wire? It is a splitter or a merger. This is coming from instruction as a tunnel. The instruction tunnel is going straight to the output of the instruction register. The instruction register has a content of FE in hexadecimal, which means instruction as a tunnel is also having FE as its content. Is that okay? So FE specified bit 4 to bit 11. What about the lower order bits? Bit 0 to bit 3, according to this picture, what are those? They're all zeros, they're constants, okay? So that means Fe becomes what as the output of this merger? Fe0. Fe0, because we're just padding one extra <coughs> hexadecimal to the right in this case. So when you click on this wire using this hand tool, it does show you it is Fe0. But this is Fe0 in binary, because you have 1111, which is F, 1110, which is E, and then 0000, which is just 0. So that's Fe0. So that means when I type Control T again, the micro code pointer will update to Fe0. Are we doing okay so far with this picture? But before we type Control T, the micro code pointer goes straight to the address bus of the ROM, which also means, and the ROM is always selected. It is connected to a constant of one. So that means when I type a Control T, Location 1 will no longer be selected. It will be location FE0 that, is lo that will be selected. Is that okay? Okay, so we'll do a control T right there. And sure enough, you know, now FE location FE0 is selected. So whatever this bit pattern is, is now presented as the actual output of the ROM. If I were to spell this out as a hexadecimal number, excuse me, as a binary number, this is in hexadecimal right now, the 1 is a 0, 0, 0, 1, the 5 is a 0, 1, 0, 1, the 0 is 0, 0, 0, 0, the 2 is 0, 0, 1, 0, the B is 1, 0, 1, 1, the A is 1, 0, 0, 0, and then another 2 is 0, 0, 1, 0. What is that doing? Hmm? It's controlling the rest of the processor, but exactly what is it doing? Let's, let's, let's try to figure it out. So you look at the picture here, and you look at the, the light green wires, and say, okay, what is that doing? The constants we are not too concerned about. We are more concerned about the control signals that go into the muxes and the demuxes, and also the enables. So right here you see one thing that is in bright green. That means we are taking output zero, of the register bank to become the output of one of the three possible outputs of this demultiplexer. So you click on this thing here, it is one zero in base two, so that means this is the actual output. This output from the register bank using the demultiplexer is now connected to this particular wire. Are we doing okay so far with this? By analyzing the input to that particular D multiplexer, we now know that output zero from the register bank is now connected to the wire that is currently selected. But where does that go? We have seen it already. We have seen this wire already. It goes everywhere, but it also goes to the data port of RAM. So from just this part here, can you tell me whether we are ready for a write operation or read operation from RAM? Are we writing from are we writing to RAM or are we reading from RAM? Who's driving the data bus? Register bank. The register bank is driving the data bus, which means the RAM should not be driving the data bus, right? Because otherwise we can end up with a bus fight. So are we reading from RAM or are we writing to RAM? Are we changing the content in RAM or are we just going to read the content of RAM? Change. We're changing, very good. Okay, so 
let's ch let's confirm that because when we look at the control signal of RAM itself you can see the RAM is currently selected but also the LD pin is a low when the LD pin is a high we are reading when the LP, LD pin is low we are writing so indeed we are attempting to write to RAM but what are we selecting to write to RAM in this case? What is specifying the content that we are writing to this location? That is controlled by register output zero select, which is this wire here. That wire specifies one one. So inside the register band, we got registers A, B, C, and D. Which one is specifying the content to be written to location zero? Register D, very good. Okay, so register D is the one that is changing, that is specifying the content of location zero. But who is specifying location zero? Okay, to figure out who is driving the location zero, we track down the address bus first. The address bus stops at the MUX, so we have to look at the MUX control signal of the MUX. It is a zero, so the MUX is selecting input zero to become its output. So now we click on input zero, and input zero of this particular MUX connects to a D multiplexer that eventually connects to output one of the register bank. In other words, just, just by looking at this part, we know another register, possibly another register, is specifying the address in RAM to be updated. Which register is driving the address bus? Well, we look at the select line, and it is one zero. One zero, this is in phase two. So of the four registers, A, B, C, and D, one zero would specify which register? C. Register C. So we know register C is specifying the address. Register D is specifying the new content at that location. Is that okay so far? <coughs> yes, no? Maybe. Okay. In C and C++ notation, this is what we are doing. So we use mouse pad. This is what we are doing. We are dereferencing register C, and that location is getting the content from register D. That's what we are doing at this point. Is that okay? Now, if location zero doesn't seem to make, doesn't seem to be very fun because it's just by default location zero, you can always change the register bank and force values into these registers. So instead of losing losing location zero, we can specify location D, for instance, and instead of changing it to zero, we can change it to mm, D five. There we go. Is that okay? So when you go back to the main picture all of those things will change. You can see that the RAM is now selecting location D and then the content that we are ready to clock in is now um, D5. Is that okay? Uh, how come it's not changing yet? We got the address done, we got the data done, we need a rising edge clock. Yep, exactly, because RAM updates on its own rising edge clock. So when we do a control T, you can see this location is now updated to a D5 content. And that's only because of the values that I injected into register C and register D, because otherwise it would just be zero and it wouldn't be a whole lot of fun. Are we okay so far? Okay, so when we go to the uh, ROM here, we are still at this point because the micro code pointer has not updated yet. It's going to update soon. So the next question is, when we update the microcode pointer, which is this guy here, and remember this is the one register that is updating on the falling edge, which means when I type control T again, it's gonna update. So the question is, when I type control T, what is going to happen to the microcode pointer and the rest of the system? So at this point, um, where is it getting its input? Where is micro code pointer getting its input at this point? Adder. From the adder, okay? So it seems like it's gonna increment, right? But then we have to look at the next location too, in ROM, and see, 
Okay, is there something funky going on there? So now we have to locate this ROM location and move on to the next location. It doesn't let me scroll. So I'm going to have to use edit content to look at that location. It's close to the end is FE0. This is FE0, okay, which is what we are seeing at this point. The next one is 2 followed by all zeros. Okay, let me highlight it. Uh, the bit pattern of this is pretty easy to figure out, right? Because 2 in hexadecimal is 0, 0, 1, 0. And then the rest are all zeros. How many zeros are following this 2? 6. So 6 times 4 is 24 bits. And then we have one extra bit to the right hand side of the bit that is selected. So we are looking at 25 zeros and a 1 all the way to the left hand side. Okay, so we have to have the bit pattern of 1 followed by 25 zeros. Okay, what is that going to do? Okay, so you look at this output here. So bit 25 is the one that will turn 1. Everything else will turn 0. When this turns 1, this OR gate will also output a 1. When this OR gate outputs a 1, what is that going to do to the register? It resets the register which means it's going to go all the way back to zero. Okay. So technically speaking, the counter does increment to FE1, but only for a very, very short amount of time. Then it resets itself <coughs> to F to zero, zero, zero again. Is that okay? So I'm, those are, I'm going to control T on the keyboard. So all eyes on the micro code pointer. See if you can spot that it changed to FE1 first and then back to 000. Did you see that? I did not. I don't have the, my eyes do not have the refresh rate of that other fly. <laughs> so I can't see that you know, fraction of a second where it turns to FE1 and then back to the you know, 000. Does this part remind you of a certain part of your music box homework assignment? exactly what it is okay so now the instruction so now the processor is ready to read the next instruction in which register controls which location in RAM I'm going to read as the next instruction the program counter very good good memory there the program counter is now specifying, oh, let's go read from location 01 in RAM. Whatever that thing is, we'll put it into the instruction register. And then in the next clock, it will put that into the micro code pointer with four zeros padded to the right hand side. And then we'll go to that location in ROM in order to execute those individual bits. Is that okay so far? This is how instructions are implemented. In other words, without the ROM, let me zoom out first. Without the ROM, without the microcode engine here, the rest of this particular design, which is only this part here, is uncoordinated. I mean, sure, we got all the components ready. Okay, we have the program counter so that we remember what what location in RAM specifies the next instruction. Cool. We have the ALU which can perform addition, subtraction, right shift, bitwise and bitwise or and bitwise not. Cool. We have the register bank that can store four individual values, register A, register B, C, and D. Okay, cool. But they are not coordinated. Okay, they just lose components. They are connected by multiplexers and demultiplexers, but who is orchestrating, hey, multiplexer one, you should turn this way, multiplexer two, you should turn that way, D multiplexer five, oh, you should turn that way, in order for these components to be connected in a meaningful way. It would be all of these tunnels. All of these tunnels serve those particular purposes. But who is specifying those tunnels? Who is specifying the values of those tunnels? The ROM itself. In other words, I think uh, we did this one, once already, right? So Topham had the controller of the of Solar Island is flipping to a page to play a tune. 
let's say it's printed <coughs> to on the, on the keyboard. Each key on the keyboard connects to a switch of the railroad. It connects to some sort of mechanism, like you know, okay, we're we're, we're dumping water from this t the water tower, you know, to whatever train, whatever engine is under that. Okay, it's also connected to um, other things, you know, on Solar Island. So when he plays a tune, all of those things will happen on Solar Island. And as a result, your music box becomes the central control system of the entire processor. It is basically the processor inside the processor. Is that okay? Yep. So and since I came in late, I have gone over this, but I mean, so if all the instructions are already stored in ROM, then wouldn't he have more like... It's not the instructions stored in ROM, it is how to perform the instructions is stored in ROM. Okay. So one way you can look at the ROM is it, they contain the subroutines, and one subroutine corresponds to one instruction. Okay. Yep. Is the ROM the instruction set, or is that a misuse of vocab? The, the, there are 16 locations in ROM per instruction. Hmm. Okay. There are 16 locations because the, of the way we pad uh, four zeros to the right-hand side. So when when you look at you know the uh, what okay let me let me zoom in first. So when you look at how microcode pointer, what values it can get, if it's incrementing, yes, it can go to just the <coughs> next location, zero 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 one zero zero two and so on. But when it's getting something from the instruction register, it can only go to something that ends with a zero as a hexadecimal number. It can go to location. 010 zero, zero in hexadecimal. It can go to location FE0. It can go to location 130. It can go to location 5F0. But it has to end with a zero because of the way we had four zeros to the right hand side of the actual 8 bit instruction itself. But that gives us 16 slices in the ROM to specify what that particular instruction needs to do. Is that okay so far? So when you look at the actual content in this ROM, you will see the pattern too. When you look at this, okay, you can see that each row, okay, it, it just so happens that one row has 16 locations, but when you look at each row, only the first two locations are really used, and the rest are all zeros. And that's because when I came up with this particular addressing scheme, I was overestimating how many slices I need in order to implement the instructions. So as it turns out, out of the 16, I only need two at the most. Mm -hmm. Which is okay, I'm just wasting wasting some virtual silicon, right? You know, this is all this is not real. Is that okay? Alright? Okay. So this class, you know, as as well as the uh, Tuesday, Thursday class, uh, but this semester benefits from the fact that you know I have refined the processor over many semesters. So at this point, there's, it's all implemented. All the instructions that I need to implement, they're all implemented already. So the next thing we want to look at would be um, the Google Drive, okay, which I think I have shared already. Let me just double check. So under the syllabus, it has a shared folder. So you go to the shared folder, and you would end up in the share folder of CISP310. So the way I show it here might be slightly different from what you would see, but it should be about the same. So you would see this as a share folder. You cannot change the content. When you go to processor, I cleaned it up a little bit. Okay, so compared to last time, it has fewer files this time because I cleaned it up in all the old files that I don't need anymore. I put it into obsolete. So these are the files that are current and something that you need to use. So the first thing we need to do is to look at the assembler manual, okay? Because this shows you, you know, what instructions you can write, okay, what is supported. So I'm gonna skip, you know, a portion of this. And then we go through the syntax. And in the syntax, I think I forgot, oh, there we go. I should have a, okay, I'm gonna copy, cut, and paste this part here. 
because you know it's it's probably better to describe what x, what x and y are, you know, and what I, what is i before we actually use those terms. So that's why is you know changing the order would be good. So I'm going to start with this part here, and uh, let me zoom in, just so that you know people in the back can see this more clearly. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to read this part here. X and Y, each one represents a register. So they can be A, B, C, or D. Okay. So X is representing something that can be A, B, C, D. Same thing with Y. Y can be A, B, C, D as well. Is that okay? I'm just using X and Y as a placeholder. <clears throat> I, on the other hand, the lowercase I, is an immediate value. Um, from your perspective, you can look at an immediate value as a constant. You spell out the value. 45, 16, and so on. Okay? So the, the language that you're learning is actually pretty simple. Um, there are certain instructions. These are called utility instructions. The utility instructions do not take any operands. In other words, you don't need to supply a specification of register for these guys. Okay? They don't use any register. They don't use any memory location. They just do a certain thing that does not require anything else. The whole instruction, H-A-L-T, is the mnemonic of this particular instruction. What it does is here. In other words, I'm, I'm borrowing the C syntax to specify what each instruction does. What does that do, the highlighted portion here? If you were to type this into a C program and execute that, that statement, what is it going to do? It's an infinite loop that doesn't do anything. It doesn't increment anything. It doesn't do a single thing. That's exactly what the whole instruction does. It stops right there, and then it, it just freezes. If you clock it all day long, control T, you know, it doesn't go in. So the purpose of the whole instruction is a convenience feature, so that you, uh, after you specify the actual code of whatever program you need to implement, you put a whole instruction as the last instruction. Then you don't have to carefully do the control T, because you know, if you execute past the, the last instruction, it might do something that you are not expecting, right? But if you put a halt instruction at the, as the very last instruction, it always stops right there. It doesn't move on any further past that point. So that's the purpose of the halt instruction. The no op instruction, NOP is the name, the mnemonic of this particular instruction, and this is the equivalent C code. Um, what does that do if you were to type open, close, paren, I mean, braces, um, and execute that block statement? What, what is, what, what's going to be done? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Except it does move on to the whatever is after that, right? That's exactly what no object would do. It would do nothing, but then it will try to execute the next instruction, the instruction next to it. Are we doing okay so far with alt and <coughs> no object? Okay. Yep. What is the purpose of no object? Um, no op is a placeholder, <laughs> so that you know when you write a loop, it makes it look like it's doing something. Because otherwise, if you have a really really tight loop of a jump going back to itself, it doesn't appear it is going anywhere. But if you put a no op first, then you will see it goes to the no op, the jump, no op, jump, no op, jump. So it does make things more visible. But the no op instruction is kind of like a mandatory instruction. Okay, so later on when we look at the actual opcode corresponding to this, you'll understand why, oh, the no op instruction is free. There's no way to get rid of the no op instruction. <laughs> so now we have the ALU type instruction. Uh, these are the ones that can do calculations and perform various type of calculations. Um, add, subtract, compare, and, or, not, and right shift are the operations. And then on the other side, we have the equivalent C notation. Um, how many people are familiar with this particular notation? It is called a compound assignment statement. Yep. You okay, so this is okay. Okay, excellent. So the add instruction is really just adding x and y and then storing the result back to x. Subtract, kind of the same thing. x minus y is stored into x. Compare looks kind of funny because it's just x minus y. Now, if you were to enter an expression like this in C you know, and by itself become a statement, 
C may optimize it out entirely because it doesn't do anything, okay? You're due to a subtraction, but what are you doing to the difference? Nothing, absolutely nothing. It's not stored. Yep. Unless you print it out. Yeah, but we, we don't have print statements in assembly. So the only thing it does is to change the flags. Remember the overflow flag? Remember the carry flag, which is also known as the borrow flag, depending on the operation? Uh, we have a Z flag, which is the zero flag, which means the Z flag is a one if and only if the result of an operation is zero itself. Um, and then we have the L flag, which is the exclusive or between the sign and the overflow flag. And then the sign flag is the most significant bit of the result of the previous operation. Those flags will be affected by x minus y. So why do we want to change those flags? Well, later on we'll see why. And then we have bitwise n, bitwise or, bitwise not, and right shift. Those are the only operations that your processor can do. What about multiplication? Well, you can do multiplication using shift and addition. Okay, it can be done. You know, it's no big deal. Yep. How do you do a left shift? A left shift is adding a register to itself. Okay. That's why we don't need it as a yeah. special operation. Is that okay? All right. So the next category are copying instructions. So the copying instructions can get a little bit confusing. The first one is loading a register with a constant. This is the only way to initialize a register with a specific no value. That's the only instruction. <coughs> is that OK? So the C equivalent code is just x equals i, where x can be a, b, c, or d, one of the four registers. And then i has to be a value that can be represented in 8 bits. Huh? It's LDI. It's LDI or load immediate. Load. Yeah, the LD stands for load. Okay. The next one is store. Okay. So the store instruction, um, in terms of syntax, I specifically use parentheses around the Y because we are dereferencing Y. Y is not the register being changed. What it points to is changed. So in the C syntax, I'm using the dereference operator to dereference y first, and then whatever location y points to gets the content of x. And both x and y are registers, a, b, c, or d. Is that OK? That fe instruction that we just looked at earlier is an st instruction. And then we have the ld instruction, which is the opposite. So in the ld instruction, y specifies the location where we want to write to excuse me, where we are reading from, and then x is the register to be updated by the content pointed to by y. Is that OK? OK, wait, yeah, go ahead. Could you explain that again? The um, LD, x, y, load, x, y? The LD instruction, load. Yeah. The load instruction goes to the location pointed to by y, which is the register and then use the content at that location to update register X. And then the last one is just copy between registers. So you specify register Y as the source register. You specify register X as the destination register. It just copies from register Y to register X. Yep. When you say the location pointed to um, yep. by Y, mm -hmm. do you mean the thing in the register or the value in RAM that was put in the register? Uh, you look at the load instruction? Yeah. So in the load instruction, y, whatever you specify as, as register y drives the address bus okay. to RAM. And then you, you control the RAM to be in the read mode so that the data bus will be driven by RAM. Whatever is presented on the data bus is used to update register X. So it's better to look at it that way using the pathways because that makes it very clear, because you, it is exactly that. But did I yeah. clarify? OK, I'm good. excellent. Cool. And then we have the jump instructions. The jump instructions are the only way you can alter the path of execution. Jump A means I'm using a <coughs> register, A, B, C, or D, to specify the program counter. In other words, if register A has a value of 6F, 
and I use JMPA in this case, that means the next location after the jump instruction is going to be 6F. Okay, we are continuing execution at the location pointed to by register X. Is that okay? Jump I, I is jump immediate with a particular value. So instead of putting a value in the register first and then we go to that location, this is a convenience feature. Okay, it allows you to say, oh, jump I to 26 in decimal. So that means the next instruction when we continue execution will be from location 26. It's just a convenient feature, a convenience feature. But without jump I and without all the I version of these the jump instructions, your program will, look, will be very, very, very messy. So it is, it's worth breaking the risk rule to have these extra instructions. The next one is JCX. JCX is described best using the C equivalent notation. It basically is using C, the carry flag, which is also the borrow flag, as the first of the three operands or the three parts of a ternary operator. If C is true, then we use X, whatever the content of the register is, as the result to update PC. If C is false, it basically doesn't do a single thing, single thing, because it's just using the program counter to update itself, so it doesn't do anything. Is that okay? That's how we do a conditional branch. So the JC, JZ, JS, and the JL instructions, those are your conditional branch instructions. That's the only way you can make a decision and say, hey, sometimes we, would, we just want to continue execution, and other times we want to go somewhere else. There are no loops. You know, there are no <coughs> loop instructions. There are no if uh, instructions in assembly language. This is all that you have. Everything that you know in C and C++, like all the loops, all the conditional statements and everything, they all have to boil down to these instructions, which probably is going to be a little bit tedious. <coughs> And then we have one last, which is, an, this is not an instruction. It is just a way for you to initialize a certain location to a content. So byte i will change whatever byte location it is currently at to the content of i. Is that okay so far? Yep. Okay, so where does the address come from in that case? The address is just. Okay, so when you specify a program, it is just going from location zero to location one to location two. So whatever that location turns out to be is gonna get the content of I. All right, so I think it's time for us to try out a few programs, okay? Now before you try out any program, <clears throat> you might, uh, when you're doing this on your own, you might want to make a copy of the assembler sheet first, okay? This is just a spreadsheet. So when you right click on this, you can go to uh, make a copy of. So you can make a copy of this in your own uh, Google Drive because uh, you cannot change this one. Okay, You can view what it has, but you cannot change it. So it has got a quick instruction here. Okay, So you want to write your program in a text editor, copy and paste it into uh, the tab called source, and then you go to the RAM file tab to get the actual compiled you know, code for that particular program. I have a uh, revision list here, okay, so I have some bug fixes and features added and so on and so forth, so if I do add any features, it'll be here. Your program can only have up to 300 lines. If anyone in this class thinks, I want to deal with a longer program, well, I can make it longer. But in assembly, 300 lines is a lot. When you write a C program for your other classes, like CISP 400 or 430, or even 360, 300 lines is it's not that much because you know open curly brace is one line already for some people. Close curly brace almost is always its own line. Then you have commands, and then you have the prototype uh, functions, and so on and so forth. So the actual content is really limited. But in assembly programming, it's a lot. Yep. Oh, so I was then. I was just gonna say, like, it sounds like 300, like, using lines is almost like an arbitrary value because you can just have fewer lines by 
Yeah. Yep, but you know, even including comments and stuff like that, if your program is exceeding 300 lines, it's going to be a tough program to deal with, especially in the assembly language. So what we'll do, what I'm going to do now, is I'm going to demonstrate how to do this. Okay. So we'll go ahead and write a relatively, relatively simple program. And we won't do any branching. We will just do uh, LDI A with uh, a particular value, like 25. <laughs> LDI B with another value, let's say 67. And we'll just do an add AB. So we'll add these two registers, store the result back to A, okay, and call that a day. That's my entire program. Fairly simple, okay? So we are expecting a register A to end up with a value of 92, I think, in decimal, yep. So you said store the value back to A. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because because that's a plus equal to b. And by the way, you know, I also the assembler also supports commenting, and I'm borrowing the commenting from C and C plus plus. So slash slash begins the comment of that line, and it goes all the way to the end of that particular line. Uh, slash star star slash is not supported. Okay, so that one, it's just not easy to implement using a spreadsheet. Yep. Assembly, the, the blank lines count for anything? Uh, you can have blank lines. They don't do. In, they don't do a single thing. Okay, so it's like seeing that. Yeah, yeah. So B equals sixty-seven. So I'm just commenting here. You can type whatever you want. You know, after comments. Um, so this is just A equals A plus B. So I can say A should end with a value of ninety-two. Okay. All right. So is that okay so far? You can also have you know um, comments at the very beginning of a line, but that's fine too. This is just a sample program, and so on. So are we doing okay so far with this? Cool. All right. So what you do is you copy and paste to the source tab here, which already has a program. It's okay. You can we can always you know, just overwrite whatever is here already. And you can also delete uh, cells here, but do not delete rows. Do not insert rows, do not delete rows, just copy and paste the cells. Is that okay? So you want to do all the editing inside the text editor. You don't want to do much editing when you're here. All right? If you have a typo and make a mistake, so let's say for in this case, um, instead of specifying register A, I mistakenly thought that there's a register E. It will complain. So there's syntax checking and say that register X is expected and E is not a register. Registers only go from A to E, I mean A to D. So there you go. Um, if you type something that is gibberish on the line that is not corresponding to an instruction like that, it will complain to. It will say unknown mnemonics. Okay. Um, there are other things you can check too, but you know, at this point, you know, these are the only ones that we need. So you have to make sure that you don't have any errors. If you do have any errors, I'm going to reintroduce the error here, and you go to the RAM file tab, it will say there are errors on the first row. So when you see there are errors, there are errors on the first row, don't bother to download this file because you have to fix the errors first. Is that okay? All right. So I'm going to go fix the error, go back to source, fix this error. I can just erase this line if I want to. I can put a no op here if I want to. I can just delete the whole thing. You know, either way it works. So I can go back to RAM file, the tab, and you can see it is now saying version 2.0 raw. That is required <coughs> by Logisim. Okay, so this part is just Logisim's thing and it has to start with this. So when, 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 we, when there are no errors, we go here, then we go click on file, we say download as, um, I just use CSV. I'm pretty sure TSV will work as well, but I'm just using CSV, you know, comma, separated value. Save the file. You can use any extension you want to because um, Logisim doesn't really care about the extension. So I'm just going to say this is 92.ram. <coughs> I use this RAM uh, extension because the content of this particular file is intended for the RAM of the processor. Okay, 
Now, if you don't like RAM as an extension, you can use TXT, you can use anything you want to. Doesn't really matter. So I click Save. All right, so now we have the program assembled, which is equivalent to compiled in the case of C++. We can go back to the processor now. So we go back to the processor. The first thing you want to do when you get back to the processor is to click the reset button before you load the program in. Okay, so your, your processor is now ready to get a new program loaded. Right click on the RAM module, click on load image. <coughs> go back to the folder where that image is. I think in this case it's temp and the file is called 92.ram because 92 is the result. Click open. So now we have the program here. Now the program is ready to run. So now you can either do, you, you can do control T, you can you can basically see exactly what happens when this program executes clock by clock, edge by edge, okay? Which is really helpful, okay, to understand how a processor works. That is something that you want to do. But what I want to do at this point is really just <coughs> zip it through um, and not really to illustrate you know, you know, blow by blow, you know, edge by edge what is happening. There are other tools you can also use. If you go under simulate, you can go to logging. It is a very useful feature when you are writing your own program and you have to debug your own program. So with this, you can log any of these components that is listed here. So you can say, I want to keep track of the program counter. Okay, fine. I want to keep track of, in the ALU, I want to keep track of flags if you want to. You can keep track of those. So you can say, uh, I want to keep track of flags out. And then with the register bank, you can say, I want to keep track of register A and register B. You can do all that. Then you can close window. Okay, closing the window simply closes the window to specify what you're logging. Okay, it doesn't stop the logging at all. And if you're impatient and you just want to see if the program is working or not, and you have faith in your, your, your logic, you can just go to simulate and click tick enabled. And you can always change tick frequency first. In other words, if you really just want to see it goes you know, really slow, step by step, you can click on like 0.5 hertz, which means it will take two seconds for one edge to occur. Or if you want to do it as quickly as possible, you know, 4.1 you know, kilohertz is the fastest you can specify. And then you just click ticks enabled, zip. <laughs> it's done. We go back to here, we click text enabled again to disable it. So now we can check the result. To check the result in this particular case, we can always just go to the register bank and see if register A has a value of 92. Is that 92? Is that 80 plus 12? Yeah, 5 times 16 is 80. C is 12. 80 plus 12 is indeed 92 in decimal. So we got the right value. But you can also go back to the log and see how it got that value. So you go to logging again, and you go to table in this case. It shows you how the program counter changed over time. It tells you how the flag output is changed over time. So right here, it is showing you that the flags went from 00, zero all the way <coughs> to 0, 1, 0, 0. The least significant bit is a carry. So if I remember correctly, this is carry, this is the Z flag, this is sign, and this is overflow. Okay. Do you think 92 should have the sign flag turned on? That doesn't seem to make sense, but yet it does. Does it? Sign flag for a bit number? doesn't seem to make sense to me. So it must have the order, must be hmm? the order of the flags. Yeah, there must be the order of the flags. Hmm. But you have to go to the uh, ALU to figure out how those things are ordered. I cannot remember exactly. Um, you can also see how register A got changed over time. You can see how register B got changed over time as well. So this is great for debugging because when you're debugging a program, you can tell at which location, because of which instruction, what register got changed in what way. Is that okay? 
So are there any questions about how to use um, the entire tool suite? Yep. So to use that like Excel spreadsheet black magic, are there any like sacrifices? <laughs> it's, nothing is black here. Everything is white. Everything is open sourced. Sorry? Are there any sacrifices? Do you, does it only work on a full moon or something? No, it works in general. I mean, you can, for those of you who are interested in, you know, how a spreadsheet can be used as an assembler, um, most of the magic is between these two tabs. So you go to the mnemonic tab, it shows you the mnemonic or the names of the instructions and also the base code of those opcodes. In other words, what this is telling you is, I'm, I'm just going to pick one here. It's telling you that the add instruction, all the add instructions are eight something in hexadecimal. So, and then we also specify the registers because when you add, you have to specify two registers. Um, so these two, I think one, where to find x, you know, this is a, sh uh, which operand is x, and column D is specify which uh, column is, which operand is y, because, you know, in one instruction they're flipped. This one says where to find immediate. It doesn't have immediate in this case for the add instruction. This one says, you know, what is the syntax of x. This is a regular expression. It is a to d, you know, but it cannot have parentheses. Um, and then for the load instruction, and also for the store instruction, they can have parentheses, and that's why they speci they're specified slightly differently. And then H and I specify the shifting of those particular bits. In other words, if I specify an A bit instruction, okay, this is a good example. So if you look at an add instruction, it specifies that it looks like this in general. One followed by one, two, three, one, two, three, four. So it looks like this in general, but where is the X, where do we specify which register is register X, which also stores the result, and which register is Y, which specifies the other register. So you look at that row, which is row 11 in this case, and right here, you know, column H tells me where to find Y, and column I tells me where to find, nope, column I tells me where to find Y and this tells me where to find X. Okay, so X is two bits shifted. So that means out of these four bits here, the, this is where I find your register X and this is where I find register Y. <coughs> so the assembler is depending on this table to define the assembly language itself and also where to find each component of a particular instruction. So it converts add a d to whatever bit pattern that it is supposed to be. So this is a table, it's table driven, and then the actual magic of utilizing this table is in the assemble um, sheet. So in this one, you know, it is a little bit more complex, but if you want to play with it, you can definitely just kind of <coughs> click on each cell and figure out, you know, how things are done. Um, I use indirect a lot and address a lot as well, um, and also regular expression inside a spreadsheet. So if you're really interested, you can go here, but if you're not interested, you can just kind of don't touch it. Just leave it alone. <laughs> if you mess it up, it's okay. Just make another copy of the original, okay? So it's not like, you know, if you mess it up, it's going to be problematic for the rest of the semester. If you mess up, okay, just download it again. Um, one thing you might want to do if you do not plan to change this in any way is to right click and protect sheet. And then you just um, specify the entire sheet. You can optionally enter a description and then just set permission. And you can say show warning when editing this page. That's usually enough to stop you know, accidental changes. So now I cannot make changes to this particular sheet without generating a warning. That's probably a good idea to uh, all of the sheets except for source. Yeah, except for source, everything. Just mark everything as <coughs> locked down. So that way you cannot you know, accidentally make a change and then your program doesn't work anymore because the assembler doesn't work anymore. So are we doing okay so far at this point? <coughs> yep. I just noticed something. So when it says the OX80, uh, 
on the far uh, right top of the ad A B. It says right after that A one. Mm -hmm. And that's because register B is zero one and then register X is zero zero. Okay, that's correct. So X is okay, cool. Yep. Awesome. Exactly. So you just did the job of the assembler. <laughs> Yeah, so before this sheet was done, you know, the whole class, you know, we did everything by hand. So we write out all the instructions and then we step by step, manually look up the table, manually shift all the registers into place, and manually translate the bit patterns into hexadecimal, and manually enter those things into the text file so the logic sim knows how to read it. Now it's all automated. Yep. But once again, you know, it's entirely open source. So if you're interested in how it works, you can look into it. If you are not interested, just use you know, the source tab and the RAM file tab. Those are the only two tabs that you need to use. Ignore all of the other ones. All right. I don't have any homework assignments as of yet at this point because you know, we are just getting into the assembler. You are just getting into the tools right now. So my un you know, ungraded homework assignment is just for you guys to play with it. Maybe just re reproduce exactly what I have here. Write a simple program, okay? Just do an add, do a subtraction, whatever you want to do. Uh, make sure you can copy and paste the program. Make sure you can get the RAM file back, run the program, and double check that the program runs the way it's supposed to, okay? Conditional branches, I wouldn't touch that yet, okay? Unless you're really kind of confident and say that, oh, I can I understand how this works and I can play with it. If you want to play with it, that's fine too. But that's a little bit more complicated. So I would just kind of uh, initialize certain locations in RAM, go to the location, grab this, indirect, go get another location, and so on. Um, and then on next Monday, then we'll start to get into, okay, here's the C code. Translate that into assembly code. So that's going to be Monday, and there will be a new note available on Canvas to discuss that because that part is a little bit more methodical. So that's why you know having text as a description would be really helpful. But this part here is all just you know graphical stuff, so it's not as beneficial. All right. So we are moving on to the lab. If you have any questions or if you just want to play with this. You know, we can do it in over at the lab, and I can answer any questions that you might have about this tool.